Hello. Thank you. So good afternoon, Oxford. Welcome to Michael Bloomberg. I think you all know Mayor Bloomberg's biography, but for those of you who don't know the full thing, um, Medford, Massachusetts, to Johns Hopkins, to Harvard Business School, to Solomon Brothers, to an organization to later be known as Bloomberg, to the mayor of New York, to uh, one of the world's greatest philanthropists. Taking on tobacco, taking on obesity, taking on gun control and more, both as mayor and philanthropist. So we are thrilled to have Mayor Bloomberg here. Let me just talk about rules of engagement. We're gonna chat for about a half an hour, and at that point, we're going to be opening it up to you for questions. I know that for those of you who are in other rooms, uh, please send your questions via the, this little device that I have. Um, and uh, hopefully we're gonna have a great afternoon. So thank you all for coming, but especially Good. Mayor Bloomberg, thank oh, you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Good, well, welcome. Uh, Welcome back to Oxford. I think you've been here before. I think somebody said in 2000 I was here. Okay. Well, well, Remember it well. It's great. Um, so, Mayor Bloomberg, we all know of you, you know, as all where you are now and how successful you are now, but there's a lot of young people out here, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to roll the clock back a little bit. So, as I said before, Medford High, Johns Hopkins, HBS Solomon Brothers. You were at Solomon for some time. 15 years. 15 years. Uh, by 30, you were a partner, if I remember correctly. I think so. Uh, a few years later, you were given the job as head of IT at Solomon. Well, the truth of the matter is I was pushed out of my job where I ran equity trading and arbitrage. There was a, somebody who had had the job before. He really got pushed out by somebody else, but then he made a resurgence, came back, and pushed me out, and I went to run um, IT there. And then a year, two years later, I got fired, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Okay, and that, that's the and you point. You should get fired the same way, trust me. So that's the point in the story I'd like to start. So age 39, uh, you know, if Solomon hadn't been so short-sighted as to fire you, perhaps you'd still be a partner there, I don't know. But what was it like to be well, I, in your I think 30s I, at that time? The truth, what I would be is working for my girlfriend, because the remnants of... Solomon Brothers wound up in Citibank, and she's on the board of Citibank. No, I would not have worked for her, but that's another issue. Um, but I grew up in a world where you got a job, and you stayed there the rest of your life. And I never would have quit in good times, there'd be no reason to, and I certainly wouldn't quit in bad times. I've always believed that you have an obligation to your employer in bad times to stay around and help them. After all, that's the other side of mm -hmm. the social contact of mm -hmm. you going to work and them giving you a job. Uh, today, it's very different. Um, you know, a lot of kids after, I don't know, three years out of school have had three jobs. Uh, why they think they can learn. I actually had to write a letter of recommendation for somebody recently to a well-known Eastern business school. And when I looked at the resume of this guy, four jobs in five years, mm -hmm. and I was very careful to craft around that, how lucky they were to be picked out of here and went there for that reason right. and that sort of thing. But the truth of the matter is I wouldn't have hired this person. <laughs> It's a good hint for those of you out there. Okay, so. Anyways, I forgot your question. Anyway, age 39, um, act one is coming to a close. Uh, act two, improbably, is you becoming an entrepreneur. A lot of our students think they want to be entrepreneurs, um, having spent your entire life in, or professional life inside a bank. What possessed you to be an entrepreneur? Well, I think the fact that Goldman didn't call me and offer me to be a general partner of their firm where I could say to Solomon, stick it. Um, <laughs> there wasn't a lot else to do. Uh, soliciting was undignified and didn't want to go look for a job. Uh, and I was lucky enough, seriously, I was a, had been a partner of, Goldman, of Solomon Brothers. And uh, when, we, when I left, we were selling the firm. Mm -hmm. So I had my share of the partnership. So I had, uh, I think the book said $10 million, and it was around that. It depended on when you sold your convertible preferreds that you had. And uh, I decided that I would try to do it on my own. I had, when I was at Solomon Brothers, at one point, it was probably about 1970, uh, my job was to do a lot of bookkeeping before we traded a block of stock. Uh, working. My first job out of Harvard Business School was in the cage counting securities. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a true story. We did it in our underwear with six packs of beer and the radio blasting. It was not air conditioned. And I, it was embarrassing to explain to my classmates what I was doing. I said, well, I was studying workflows of how all these certificates came and went. The truth of the matter is I was a clerk counting coupons. Uh, but eventually I had to do all this clerical work. And I went to Billy Solomon, the managing partner. I said, I'd read about these things called computers. And we could take all this information, store it overnight, and in the morning, if you needed it, if somebody came in with a block of stock, you could hit a button, and out would come this information. And everybody said, really? That's that possible? And so Billy said to me, oh, if you want to work at night, um, you know, get somebody from the data processing and see if you can build something. And you didn't get paid extra for that. It was not a world where you got extra. You were expected to work 24-7. <laughs> Uh, anyways, I got a guy, and we did it, and that was successful, and then we redid it. And so when I got pushed out in 1981, uh, I had said to Solomon, I was going to try to do this on my own. Would you be interested in being a partner? And they said, no, go do it on your own. Uh, and so I started it. Okay. So for those of you budding entrepreneurs, getting fired, not a bad thing at all. Um, okay. So the, I mean, the only advice I can give you, it is... The most exciting time was day one when I was the only person in the company. The second was day two when there were four of us. Uh, and being an entrepreneur is great. And it's a challenge and it's exciting. But if you get a chance to go and to learn about the real world with a great firm, you should do that. It doesn't matter how much you get paid. It doesn't matter what your title is. Uh, I went to Solomon rather than Goldman, who had both offered me a job. Um, Goldman offered me a job at $14,000 a year, which was a lot of money in those days. Solomon offered me a job at $9,000. Uh, I sat down with the number two guy in the company, John Goodfriend, and I said, I'd like to come to work here. Uh, and he said, why? I said, well, because Goldman told me what they wanted me to do. And when I asked your sales manager who was doing the hiring, what would I do at, at Solomon? He said, how the hell would we know? We don't even know who you are. You know, we're just hiring. You off a piece of paper or an interview, and who knows what our needs are going to be down the road, and who knows what your skill sets are. You have to find out in the real world. And that made so much more sense to me than Goldman. The trouble was Solomon was offering me $9,000, Goldman $14,000. $9,000, I had a budget of $120 for rent and $5 for food each day, and I showed it to a good friend. I said, I just can't come. He said, how much do you need? And I said, I didn't want to be piggy, so I said, $11,500. And he said, fine, $9,000 salary, $2,500 alone. He got up and he walked out of the room. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do, so I showed up June 1st or whatever it was. Okay. And my first bonus, six months or four months later, was $500 forgiveness for the loan. And the next year, it was a $2,000 forgiveness alone. I have the document at home with him signing both. And uh, it was the smartest decision I made because Solomon gave me a chance to do lots of different mm -hmm. things. And I said at a memorial service for Billy Solomon, and no offense to Harvard Business School, we both went, but I learned more from Billy Solomon and John Goodfriend about management in the years I was there than I did for the two years at Harvard Business School. I watched how people really took care of others and dealt with problems and um, uh, delegated work out, and uh, it was uh, a great education. And then when I became an entrepreneur, was I more ready or less ready? I don't know. You never know. Um, but a lot of the entrepreneurs, I will say, when I see them, they start out and they, you say, what are you doing? Well, we're building an app to open and close your garage door from 3,000 miles away. And I think, oh, okay, that's nice, but, you know, it's mm -hmm. never going to work. Or it'll work, but it's never going to be sold. And so don't rush into being an entrepreneur. See what the opportunity is out there. And if that's the chance you have, do it. If it's not, do something else. How the firm that you started, Innovative Market Solutions, the vision that you had for that firm, how close or far away was that from what would ultimately become Bloomberg? Well, the basic product that we still sell is based on the design that we created back in 1981. The software has been rewritten a thousand times. It's in much different languages. The, the vast, the bulk of data and the speed of calculations and where and how you can get at the data is all stuff that never existed back then. I mean, keep in mind, your cell phone has more storage capacity and more computer power than the biggest IBM computer back in 1981, literally. Mm -hmm. And today we do billions of calculations a day and then you know, a calculation took a second. There aren't that many seconds in a day. So uh, it's very different, but it's the same concept. We 
There were people, there were companies out there, Reuters and Tellerate were the two main ones. They collected data and they displayed the data. And the concept we had is to take that and let you do something with it, which is very novel. Nobody really ever thought that you could do that. What did we do at the beginning? You did a yield calculation or you grew, drew a graph of the last sale in a stock. Um, and uh, you sorted it in two ways, one by uh, who owned the stock and one by what the uh, institution owned, uh, crossways, if you will. Uh, and we did it, and we did it long enough and good enough that by the time our competitors woke up that there was something else you could do with data, it was too late, and first mover advantage carried us from then on. But I don't think there's anything fundamentally different than what we started with four employees, and today we have 20,000. What possessed you to run for mayor? I think two things. Um, I like challenges, and everybody said government could never work, and I always thought that was bullshit, that you could make it work. And I'd been there for a long time. It was in 01, I guess, I decided mm -hmm. to run, and I started in 81. And after 20 years, it's uh, fair for the other employees and the other owners, of which the three guys that started with me had a piece of the action, a few other small ones. Um, uh, it was, and, and for our customers, it was time to give everybody a new restart and try new things, and it would be good for me. And I will say I was away for 13 years, including the year I ran for office, and I came back, and the people that I put in charge did a, a phenomenal job, and had I been there, I don't know that it would have been any better. They did things very differently, and I've been spending the last three years trying to roll some of what they did back, because it's not the way I think the firm should be run. But it worked, and the rollback is a gradual thing to make sure that we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, and um, I did, what I also showed was that you don't need me in the company. And I don't know that I would ever want to deal with a company that I really depended on, as do our customers, mm -hmm where if one person got hit by a truck, they wouldn't be able to continue to provide the service that uh, I, I need. Mm -hmm. And so I showed that without me, the company can do just fine, thank you very much. Better or worse, nobody knows, but it certainly can continue and to provide the service. So if I try to sell you something and say you're gonna be dependent on this, and if we stop, you stop, and that really is true, the market stop, would stop if our system stopped, um, you have much more confidence that that's not a, a risk you have to run. As mayor, what are the things, say the three things you're most proud of doing? Well, number one is that uh, after 12 years in office, life expectancy in New York City uh, improved by three years and was three years greater than the national average. And if extending and improving the quality of life of your citizens isn't the government's job, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one number. I try to look at one thing that encompasses a lot of individual processes or uh, opportunities that are different. Um, we brought down crime, we uh, uh, reduced fire deaths, we reduced traffic deaths and infant mortality. Uh, but then there is creating the economic engine that's New York, uh, cultural institutions that bring in business, reducing some of the impediments to starting a business in terms of permitting and that sort of stuff getting together people who uh, w have the skills that the companies need. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose that would be uh, one of the other major ones. Pretty big accomplishments. You've been Well, it, it may be, but as somebody pointed out that if I ever had a 90% approval rating, which nobody gets, uh, but if you had a 90% approval rating, it still would mean 840,000 New Yorkers did not like me. So. <laughs> sort of puts it in perspective. And that's not a bad segue to talk about leadership for a moment. You've been a leader in the business world, a leader in the government world, and a leader in civil society as a philanthropist. We sometimes talk about tri-sector leadership and trying to figure out whether leadership in these sectors are, is the same, is it different? So how do you lead differently running Bloomberg versus being mayor versus running your philanthropic activities? Well, I think there's more in common than there are differences. Um, the differences are the way the press treats you. Uh, business press is dramatically different than 
the um, public press, the political press, and that's one of the reasons why business people don't typically succeed when they go over to the private to the public sector, mm -hmm. and 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 don't even want to go because when they realize how tough that is in terms of disclosure and um, trying the the, the the political press needs to sell scandal and failure, and the business press needs to tell a story. So if you said to the business press, um, I'm not going to do this until, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the oceans uh, rise 20 feet, they would call and say, you didn't really mean that, did you? What do you and give you a chance to rephrase it in ter the, the, the terminology. Uh, the political press would have you drowning in a big puddle. And so that's one of the differences. And another difference is in the government world, government is run for the providers, not the beneficiaries. Nobody quite understands that, but that really is true. And that explains why in government you move monies from programs that do work to monies to programs that don't work. And in business, you do the reverse. In business, one profit line's great. You, you take away it from the others and, and double up. In government, you double down, if you will, and the reason is because the people in the program that doesn't work uh, want to keep their jobs. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, the people in the program that does work will be upset about that. No, because they know if you take care of these people, you'll take care of them. Um, and in government, if the head person, if the head woman or man gets hit by a truck, well, in, in business, if the head man or woman gets hit by a truck, everybody moves up. In government, if the head person gets hit by a truck, all the top management moves out. And so I've always thought in business, the loyalty is to the organization, and in government, the loyalty is to the head person. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, I don't know what number of president of the United States he was, is he's most famous for leaving being the president of Princeton and going to become governor of New Jersey. And he said he did that because he wanted to get away from politics. So, Fair. Uh, but, but he, um, he was basically dead and they just kept his body going and his wife ran the US government for a while. Why? Because his whole cabinet and all the senior staff wanted to keep their jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what, that, that's the differences. I think, what is the commonality? People, it, business and government, every organization is people and leadership. Um, you have to attract the good people. You have to keep them there working and working together. And they want recognition and respect. And you don't have to give them everything they want in terms of monetary compensation or compensation satisfaction. But they've got to know they have a career path and that you appreciate them and that you uh, are trying to feel their pain. You don't even have to feel their pain. I, I always looked and said, well, wait a second. If you look at some areas in New York City that I'd never been to and never even heard of before I became mayor, what on earth do I have in common with the people that live in those areas? You know, I'm a white Jewish billionaire. Um, <laughs> but seriously, you know, I, I've never lived their lives. Um, my family was a lower middle class family. My father worked uh, seven days a week as a bookkeeper, but we never went without food or anything. And why did they vote for me? And I think the answer is that they thought that I was trying to understand what they needed and I was genuine and sincere. That's the difference. And you look at these candidates that promise everything and deliver nothing and you wonder why people don't vote for them because they have a sense that it's just all bullshit. But if you, and I got elected and reelected and reelected, so I must have been doing something right. But, you know, at my company, um, we have a couple rules. No titles, although I will say I've found some people that have put titles in their business cards, but okay. Um, we have no offices. I banned offices from day one. I've always worked in a bullpen at Solomon Brothers and then in my company. Uh, I did come back after 13 years away, and I found that a number of the senior people didn't have offices, but they did have a conference room right next to their desk with the family pictures in the room. <laughs> and so this is the first week, or second, third week, and I was there. Uh, that Monday they came in and all the glass walls had been taken down. And then I discovered about a month later, I was walking around and just something was funny. I'm standing by somebody's desk talking to them and their desks looked bigger 
than the desk that I had. I'm in the middle of a big room with lots of people around. Everybody's got the same size desk. And so the, I realized there were a dozen odd people that had bigger desks. Uh, that Monday they came in and they were back to the regular size desk and all this stuff was in a cardboard box on the top. And nobody complained, it's fair. <laughs> but but I'm, seriously, I, I think leadership is showing people that you care. And if I ask you to do something, uh, you've got to feel that if I had the skill sets and if there wasn't an allocation issue of what I'm needed someplace else better, I'm willing to do your job. Mm -hmm. And the little things, it, it always, I love this, you go into a corporate uh, uh, business park and right by the front door there's a sign reserved for B.W. Smith president. Now two things, number one, his car ain't there. So I'm coming into work and the boss is not there what kind of a leadership is that? If I were him, I'd have a park, a, a space way in the back so nobody would know I wasn't there. <laughs> and number two, I want the people that work for me to be there right and go straight to their jobs. I'll take that walk across the long parking lot in the big rain if it means they're there quicker and doing more. Mm -hmm. And it's the little things, these small things that um, you, you insult people when you create class distinctions that are meaningless. Yes, you have to have a structure. You have to know who you work for and who works for you. But that doesn't mean they have to walk around with a sign on their lapel saying, I'm better than you. And we do this all the time. If I give you a promotion and give you a title, all of a sudden you think you're better than you were before, so you're looking for a raise, or you're out looking for a better job now that you have this title. And I didn't give her the job or the title, and now she's annoyed, and so she's out looking for a job, all because of, she's calling you an assistant vice president like every teller in the bank. I mean, what's the, <laughs> what's the point of doing that? And people do it all the time. I'll never forget going into Avon's offices at 9 West 57th Street. They were moving out and the space was for rent and I took a look at it. And you walk down the hall, there were 10 offices. Each office had a secretary inside an office uh, of the hall and there was a life-size oil portrait of the executive. And you walked in and then you went to the inner office where the secretary's secretary sat. And there was another picture. And you wonder why the company was going out of business. Uh, this is not hard stuff, guys. Fair. So we're going to turn it over to the students soon, but I can't help but ask a few questions about current events. So you, were, you didn't mince your words uh, at the Democratic National Convention, uh, yet Donald Trump is our president now. What Shows advice? you the influence I have. <laughs> Many of us wish otherwise. Uh, what advice would you give him? Everything is people. He's got to pick people who have the right skill sets and then support them and delegate authority to them. Uh, most people never pick people that are smarter than them. And they may do it by accident, but not deliberately. <laughs> I, I have always, uh, it's a true story, I, I, as God is my witness, I always look to see whether the person that I'm trying to hire is smarter than me, and if I think they are, all things being equal, I'd certainly hire them. You do have to have somebody that has the right skill sets and willing to fit in and work collaboratively and cooperatively. But uh, I always wanted uh, people smarter than me. And it takes a confidence, uh, particularly in government, uh, why more than business, I don't know, but it, I think it is true in government. Uh, there, there's, it takes a confidence that you're not gonna lose the jo your job to the person that you're bringing in. Um, and Donald Trump, well, he shouldn't have trouble doing that, but that, no, it's not true. <laughs> I'm glad you that said that and not me. <laughs> no, I, I can tell you about Donald Trump. I know him casually. We played in golf, charity golf tournaments a couple times. I don't think I've ever had dinner with him, but I had a long conversation with him on the 9-11 weekend. Uh, we, uh, it's a memorial service, and he said to me, um, and we were just the two of us standing there. Everybody else had basically left, and while we're still reading the names of the 3,000 people that died, and he said, uh, I, said hey, "I saw your speech." He said in, uh, in Philadelphia. He said, "But, but you really do love me, don't you?" <laughs> and I said, "Yes, Donald, I do love you. I just disagree with everything you've ever said." <laughs> and we had, and we had a good laugh. If you sat and had dinner with Donald Trump, you'd probably walk away saying, "Everything he said is bullshit. He can't be doing that." But you have a good time. He is socially. A, a nice person. Will he be a good president? I hope so, because we desperately need leadership in the country and in the world. I think it's more dangerous today than I've ever seen it before. 
Um, will he pick good people? I think you'll, you can read the tea leaves. There's a struggle between some of advisors who want ideologues and to reward those people who worked on his campaign and stood up for him. And then there are others that say, no, no, we have to have people that can do the job, Donald, otherwise you're gonna get blamed when the shit hits the fan, if you will. Um, and how that turns out, I don't know, we're 10 days into his term as president-elect. And all he's done so far, I guess, is he's thrown Chris Christie out. Um, who worked very hard for him, but um, some very smart person said that the um, uh, ultimate in political independence is monumental ingratitude. And so he didn't pay him back for all the work, and in all fairness, he made the right decision there. There's not a guy who should be in. The others, we'll see. So apart from picking smart people and the right people, any other advice in terms of domestic policy, economic policy, well, you, foreign policy? John is going to learn. You don't change anything precipitously overnight. Um, there's, if there were simple solutions to complex problems, we would have solved those problems a long time ago. Um, in his first week, he was going to deport 12 million undocumented people. He's now said he's only going to uh, deport those who have been convicted of criminal acts, which means he will deport fewer people than Barack Obama's been doing. So he turned around flip-flop there. He said he was going to get rid of Obamacare, our health system. Uh, now he says, well, he's gonna keep the part that gives health insurance to 20 million people. Of course, if you do that, you gotta keep the rest of it because it's the rest of it that's funding the party wants to keep, <laughs> minor problem. Um, so we'll see. Uh, you know, is he going to walk away from climate change? I don't think the public would permit that today. The public in America, don't know about here, but the public in America and corporations in particular really do care about climate change. No corporation is going to be running, willing to run the risk of getting caught flat-footed without taking prophylactic steps in case the oceans do come up and the storm does come in and what, or there's no water or what, no electricity uh, and the public is behind that. So we'll see what happens. Um, but he's got to find people that have the temperament and the intellect to do some of these jobs and he's going to find that very difficult to do because his background is not running the railroad. And these executive jobs are running the railroad and not policy jobs. You can always hire somebody, in fact you have no choice, to create policy, whether you're the mayor, the governor, the president or whatever, the, because the demands on you because of your title are so great that you don't have time to do that, whether it's kissing babies or giving a award to the NFL football winners or whatever. Um, you just, you, you have to get down and, and spend full time running this, the organization. In the United States has ex the military, probably four million employees. That's a tough job. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, you have to have experience. You don't, you can't, it's like skiing. You can't read a book on skiing and think you know how to ski. You've got to go out there and fall a number of times and get up and eventually you do learn, but coming in and having to ski a double black diamond day one is very tough to do and that's what I think it's fair to say the current president of the United States, Barack Obama, did not have any executive experience. He's been very good at some things and not so good at others. And that, I think, is the reason. Donald Trump, he says he's a businessman, but he's a real estate owner. He, he's never run a business in terms of running an org. He just hasn't. Doesn't make him, make him a bad person, but that's not, when he says he's a businessman, it, it's not the kind of business person you have to have. So, <laughs> I think we could go on on Mr. Trump for quite a long time. But let's talk about the people who voted for Mr. Trump and also the people who voted for Brexit. There's a lot of unease and a lot of unhappiness and anger. Um, what would you do to address the fundamental divide that we're seeing both in, in the United States and Western Europe? Well, there's two things. One is a procedural thing. We, the press unanimously, and the bookies, why we think the bookies know anything about the future, I've never figured out, but they knew that Brexit was not going to pass. And they were wrong. And everybody, every newspaper in America, and if I'm, everyone virtually can't find an exception, endorsed Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton and thought she was going to win. So what, it, this, this 
cycle, a virtuous cycle where we feed on ourselves and we convince ourselves something is right and we don't tolerate anybody who thinks differently. There were an awful lot of people who were going to vote for Donald Trump, but they just would not say it, not even to the pollsters. Why? Because everybody vilified them. How could you be so stupid to vote for him? And they, a lot of them said, wait a second, that's not stupid. I like the guy. I, I like his policies. Whether he can do them or not and implement what he's promised or not, that's a separate issue. And most people don't have the ability to judge, so they look at it. You know, Barack Obama, he, his people used to say, he was so wonderful, he gave a great convention speech four years before he got elected. He's a great speaker. Well, he's a decent speaker, and he's done some good things as President of the United States. But that's not a reason to give him a job, and yet that is the basis on which the public picked him. And in the case of Donald Trump, he's promised to, uh, to uh, bring back coal jobs. Good luck, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, if you live in the coal business world in West Virginia, and people say, well, you know, we're creating more jobs out in California in solar than we are in destroying jobs in the coal mines. It's not very useful to you to know that those are other jobs. You can't move, you can't get the skill sets. That's not, you're out of a job. Globalization does create more jobs than it takes away. So that's not our real problem. Our real problem is technology, which we can come back to. But if, my girlfriend said to me the other night, how could any woman vote for Donald Trump? Yeah, he's all sorts of allegations of things he said and done and that sort of thing. I don't know how much of that's true or not, but let's just stipulate that it's all true. How, why could you, put, you vote for him? Because for an awful lot of women who look at their husbands, they live in a part of the world where the husband's the breadwinner, middle America, and uh, the kids uh, need uh, clothes and schools and they have a house, and she says, my husband's going to lose his job. I don't care what Donald Trump does with women. I want somebody to keep my husband working and not working flipping hamburgers at McDonald's, which is the only other job he's going to ever get if he loses his current job in a factory. And that's what everybody missed. Uh, there was a guy here, Peter Palumbo, a longtime uh, member of the House of Lords. He used to be chairman of the Serpentine Gallery. It's a, an art museum in London, which I now chair. And, and Gemma Reed does all the work. Thank you, Gemma. Um, and uh, Peter kept saying to me, you, nobody understands that Brexit is going to pass. Because outside of London, it is so different. They have nothing in common with the people in London. The, the pace of business, the kind of business, the, the policies that people in London think are appropriate. And take a look at a map of the United States after the election. There were slivers of blue along the East Coast and the West Coast, and the rest of the country solid red. And if you think about it, we, the intelligentsia, people who could make it into this room, um, we believe in a lot of things in terms of equality and protecting individual rights that make no sense to the vast bulk of people. They're not opposed to you having some rights, but there's a fundamental disconnect between us believing the rights of the individual come first and the general belief around the world, I think it's fair to say, that the rights of society comes first. And so um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, uh, the bathroom issue in, in, in the United States. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you want to know, is somebody a good salesman, give them the job of going to the Midwest and picking a town and selling to that town the concept that some man wearing a dress should be in the locker room with their daughter. If you can sell that, you can sell anything. I mean, they just look at you and they say, what on earth are you talking about? And you say, well, this person identifies his or her gender as different than what's on their birth certificate. And they say, what, what do you mean? You're either born this or you're, or you're born that. Um, and, you know, I will say in our prison system in New York City, we have to have the policy when you walk in, you know, Drop your trousers, you go this way, you go that way. That's it, because you can't sit there and you can't mix things in a jail. That's a practical case of where you have to make a decision. But it's so many things that we are nuanced and um, the issue, the social issues that we're very proud of, uh, of achieving aren't, believing, aren't believed by the vast bulk of the people. I think gay marriage much to my amazement, came in with a lot less 
of a problem, I would have thought. And I think the reason gay marriage got passed in America became the law of the land and is not a big deal. It's not something anybody, Obama would not try to throw that out. He's already said, or, or and, uh, Trump, he's, it's the law of the land. The, the statistics are that 10% of the public is gay, which basically means every family has a gay member in it. So even if you don't believe in it, you're not going to go against your family. And so you have people like Dick Cheney and Rob Portman, very conservative politicians, and they favor gay marriage. Why? Because they have gay children. So it's personal with them. But um, uh, abortion choice is still very controversial because not every family has had a member who needed or wanted an abortion, and their religious organizations keep saying it's bad. And, you know, we have a strange relationship with our religions. Most of us and most of our religions say we're going to do something and then go outside and do something very different. There are religions where people are actually very honest. And I've always thought Mormons do that. They are, they're much more honest about their religion than most others. If they say before we leave church, we're going to help each other, before they leave church, they schedule you and I are going to meet at 10 o'clock from 10 to 11 on Wednesday, and you and Howard are going to meet on Thursdays, and that sort of thing. And they do what they say. And most of us don't deal that way. So I'm not checking my email in case anybody wants to know. I'm actually checking your questions. So I'd like to go. I have a lot more, but these folks do as well. So uh, for those of you who have, have sent your questions in, I've got them here. I think some of you voted on them as well. So if I can just try some of these. Uh, a bit unfiltered. No filter, I think, is what we say on Instagram. Um, <laughs> so, Mayor Bloomberg, you chose not to run Mike, for... Mike, Mike, Mike. Mike, you chose not to run for president. Yes. Would you ever reconsider that decision in no. the future? Uh, it's um, the Constitution of the United States says that uh, you have to have a majority... Uh, so that a candidate has to have a majority of the electoral votes or it goes to the House of Representatives. Uh, we would have gotten, a th we did a lot of polling, we would have gotten a third of the votes, Hillary would have gotten a third, Trump would have gotten a third, would have gone to the House of Representatives because that's in the hands of the Republicans, they would have picked Trump, and I would for the rest of my life and afterwards been the person that gave us Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. and the results turned out to be the same, but at least you can't blame me, I was on the other <laughs> side. <of that. laughs> okay. Um, so we have mics in the room for the folks in the room. So let's take one from the room if we can, and then I'll go to one from the other rooms as well. First one up. Um, how about, uh, yeah, back there. Thank you. Uh, Please identify yourself. Please make the question short. Yep. Uh, you and Hollingsworth uh, doing my MBA here. Mr. Bloomberg, um, Trump got in on, you know, a growing sense of inequality, um, not just in the United States, but across the world. Uh, there's, there's been a divide, and there's an increasing divide between the haves and haves nots. Um, what do you think business leaders, um, what's their responsibility to addressing that divide and uniting, um, you know, perhaps the Central America and, and the coasts? Well, uh, number one, you got a question, I question whether you're right. Uh, we have, in the last four decades, cut poverty in half in the world. If you measure poverty by people that go to bed without a uh, meal in their stomach, without a roof over their head, a meal in their stomach, and can't read. So society is making some progress. Life expectancy is going up. We've learned to cure more diseases. We're about to eradicate, thanks to Gates and a little bit of money from us, eradicate polio. So we're doing some things to help. Number two, the bottom 20% is a lot better off than the bottom 20% in the past. The bottom 20% in America, the bottom 20% in New York City, 80% have cars, 30% uh, have two cars, virtually everybody has a cell phone, uh, virtu they all have 72-inch uh, uh, TV screens and that sort of thing. So there is some of this, so you've got to be careful in that. Having s and incidentally, before we address the basic issue, um, if you measure poverty by the top 1% versus the bottom 20%, you get very different numbers than if you measure it by uh, the uh, 2 to 20 percent down from the top here and the bottom 20 percent. Because of very low interest rates, you have inflated values of fixed assets, which are almost always owned by the very wealthy, and so they've shot up. 
maybe it's the top 5%. But if you adjusted for that, it's not as dis disparate as you, you would think. So that, that's, that's what the real world is. We have a problem of income inequality, nevertheless. I would argue what's more important is we have a, a, a uh, educational inequality. There was a, a story on the front page of the FT today, I think it was, that said there's nobody from the poor districts of London that comes to this great school, one of the great universities in the whole world, and zero from poor neighborhoods, at least that I assume the statistics are right and they didn't just cherry pick one neighborhood. Um, so that is more important than uh, net worth because that says what the future is going to be for the young people. Uh, having said all of that, you can fix the inequality. You take money from the rich and you give it to the poor. Uh, we've always done that. We have a tax system generally around the world that is graduated at the top end. Progressive tax system takes more money from the rich per capita and, and redistributes it. Uh, tuition in a university in America certainly is a Robin Hood plan. You want The kids are always on the wrong side of that. They always want lower tuition. No, you don't. You want to raise tuition in the university as high as you can so the wealthy will contribute more money and then use the extra money to subsidize those kids who have no money. If you reduce the amount of money you take in from the rich, it's the poor that get hurt, not helped. So some of these things are a little bit counterintuitive. But you take the money from the rich and you give it to the poor, you do it for altruistic reasons, you do it because you don't want the poor on your doorstep and a variety of things. But I think what you gotta understand is the people who are getting the subsidy want the dignity of a job. They want the dignity of being responsible for their family and being able to take care of it. And that's the conundrum we're going to have here because technology is reducing the ability to give them the jobs. We just, more and more, if you think about it, the agrarian society lasted 3,000 years and we could teach processes. I could teach anybody, even people in this room, so no offense intended, to, to be a farmer. You, it's a process. You dig a hole, you put a seed in, you put dirt on top, add water, up comes the corn. Then we had 300, you could learn that. Then, then um, you have 300 years of the industrial society. Uh, you put the piece of metal on the lathe, you turn the crank and the direction of the arrow and you can have a job. And, and we created a lot of jobs. 1.98% of the world worked in, uh, in agriculture today. It's 2% in the United States. Uh, now comes the information economy. And the information economy is fundamentally different because it's built around replacing people with technology and the skill sets that you have to learn are how to think and analyze. And that is a whole degree level different you have to have a different skill set. You have to have a lot more gray matter. It's not clear the teachers can teach or the students can learn. And so the challenge for society to find jobs for these people who we can take care of giving them a roof over their head and a meal in their stomach and a cell phone and a car and that sort of thing. But the thing that's the most important that will stop them from setting up the guillotine someday is the dignity of a job. And nobody's yet come up with a simple solution in this day and age to how we create jobs particularly for people already out of school. I can tell you how to fix the school system so that the kids come out with better skills, um, more ability to appreciate life and to work collaboratively and collectively and read the instruction manual and, and follow orders. But it's very hard to figure out where the jobs they're gonna get will come from. And for those that are already out in the workforce, to get them back into the system and teach them new skill sets is almost impossible. It's very, very hard to do, and nobody's really showed they could do it. And there's individual cases where you can retrain, I don't want to overstate it. But the coal miner I talked about in West Virginia is not going to move and his family out to California where the solar jobs are. And even if he got there, he's not going to get those jobs. Nobody's going to hire an older person. It's fascinating to me. Older people are always willing to hire younger people. Younger people are not willing to hire older people. I think it's just they're afraid of older people that may have skill sets they don't have and you know, they, they make fun of them and they say they're not able to change and think, none of those things are true. There are plenty of older people who are really smart and really can do new things if you gave them the opportunity. But there's a, a, a discrimination 
among, from young managers to higher older people. It's reasonably well documented, I think, uh, and, and certainly observable. And so your basic premise is it's not that bad, it's better than it was before, but it's a big problem, and the problem is not the redistribution of wealth. It is the job where you go in every day. And you say, what's business's responsibility? Business is, it's not business's job. Business's job is to take the investor's money and to maximize the money by creating products that the public wants and are willing to pay for. And you can't say to them they should go and create jobs deliberately. You can have a tax policy that encourages that, and that's one of the things you should do, and then use the collective wisdom of all of the heads of companies to create jobs, small pockets, and it adds up to a lot of jobs. That's what I would do right away. Tax you, your taxes are lower the more people you hire, and hire the fewer people you hire, and let capitalism work, because government's not gonna be able to solve the problem directly. But short of that, if, gov if, if who's gonna create the jobs? Well, if it's not industry, there's only one group left to do it. And so the next time you want more efficient government, think twice. I'm not so sure you do want more efficient government. Uh, back in the 30s, we created an inefficient government. We put people to work building infrastructure we needed. They weren't maybe the, you could have had other people do it more efficiently, but we wanted to create jobs and we did and it took us, World War II was really took us out of the depression, but it got us through the depression. Uh, and maybe that is the answer that we're gonna say, government's gotta create no-show jobs or jobs you have to show, but that aren't needed. We can pass a law that says you gotta move all the paper from the left to the right side of the building every day and back again. Okay, and then they gotta hire, pe the government will hire people to do it. But it's better than people being out in the streets, desperate for a job, not being able to find it, destabling society. So we started a little late. If it's okay with you, can we run a few more? Yeah. Great. Um, so some more questions. Uh, this young woman right here. Uh, my name is Lisa. I, I study public policy. And um, I have a question. Um, like. I'm from Ukraine, and the mayor of my city is Vitaly Klitschko, world-famous uh, boxer, uh, champion, and he... I know uh, him and his brother, actually. <laughs> I really do. We have the same golf coach. <laughs> well. <laughs> True. Who knew? It shows, you, it shows you how small the world is, though. Well, uh, every day he has uh, he receives lots of um, critics against uh, his... Uh, activities um, his job as a mayor because uh, he has to uh, fight against the critics as he is just a sportsman and he doesn't have any experience in politics um, and uh, my question is what would you actually um, advise people who don't really have experience in politics or in management who but who have that responsibility for society, but they come from... Well, from number one, you know, I, I don't know why you vote for somebody that doesn't have experience. <laughs> but the skill sets to get elected are very different than the skill sets to govern. So a lot, most people, people that get elected by definition have the skill set to get elected unless they get very lucky. And it's like the, in, the, in the United States, we just had two candidates. The only person that uh, could beat them, or that, that, that they could beat was the other candidate. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, if you think about it, Hillary and, and, and Donald did not have big support. They both had 70% disapproval ratings, and yet one of them won, and the other one actually got two million more votes than the one that won because um, of our, our electoral uh, college system. Uh, but assuming you get through the, enough skills to get elected, then the problem is how do you get the skills to run? Some people have the, to run a, an organization. Some people have it. Some people don't. Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies has a number of programs to train mayors, one of which we just started with the uh, uh, Harvard Business School and the uh, Harvard Kennedy School of Government, uh, the Bloomberg Harvard, I forget what the name of the program is, I didn't worry about it, I was interested in the, the order of the names and we won that battle. Uh, but <laughs> it's amazing how capitalism works. Uh, uh, but we bring in mayors seriously from around the world and try to train them. Uh, and Bloomberg has a number of programs, uh, 
um, of uh, we, we fund uh, innovation people that go out and work in small cities. We have programs where cities compete uh, across 300 cities in Europe competed. Uh, 300 cities in America did the year before. This year it was Latin America. We haven't announced the winners there. But you have to come up with ideas that are useful for your city and transferable to others. And there's real money involved, $5 million to the winner and a million to each of the, or euros for the others, the, the next four. And, and so you can teach people, but some people just don't have the, the, the patience for it. Some people don't have the temperament. Some people probably just don't have the intellectual capital, uh, the, the, the intelligence to go and understand why you need it. One of the things that shocked us when I, when I left office, I took half a dozen of our commissioners, and they work for Bloomberg Philanthropies, our philanthropic arm, um, as a nonprofit consulting firm for cities. And so cities around the world can apply. Uh, we pick those where there's a strong mayor who will implement, and who's going to be around for a while, will implement whatever we recommend. And there's a scheme where they have to raise some money, and the donors make, sign a paper saying they won't give it to the city unless the city follows what we recommend. Because I don't just want to write position papers. We want to push our ideas of how we think it. And you don't have to do it, but there's a carrot as well as a stick. Um, and um, it, we, we found, we thought we'd go to all these cities and find small, uh, uh, small microcosm of what New York City is. They just didn't have as much money or as many people and not quite as sophisticated. And it turns out most cities just don't have any of the structure that New York has. They just don't have an organization that goes out and tries to recruit cultural institutions and bring them in and work with them and make sure that government doesn't get in their way and they can get funding from the private sector and help them and that sort of thing. They, didn't ha they don't have a, a phone number you can call and get access to all the services. Well, we have a, something called 311, you dial 311 and one person answers and we can answer any question or we'll get you an answer that you have for, uh, the 300, from the 300,000 people that work for New York City. So it's very hard, but there are programs that can do something and help people. And I don't know that we're working, I don't think we're working with that city. We, in London, for example, we did a lot of work with Boris Johnson on trying to help find a site, uh, use for the uh, Olympic site and some other stuff. Mexico City, we do traffic stuff and lots of public health things. Um, uh, but cities all around the world and a lot of cities in America. So why don't we take one more question, if we could. Uh, way too many to choose from. How about the woman uh, back there? Impressive, you can see that far. <laughs> Good glasses. Um, yeah, thank with you contacts. so much for addressing us uh, tonight. Um, I have a question regarding something I've discussed a lot lately, which is somehow also related to the question about inequality. And this is um, basically about what kind of role the um, division of like so let me just explain before I ask a question so if we can make it quick please yeah so, so I'll make it quick so in the Netherlands in the 1960s um, you had a split in society but it was split between sort of the Catholics and the Protestants and but within such a pillar people talk to each other so both the lawyer and the shoe polisher basically would go to the same church and care about each other and I think that one of the problems that became visible with the Brexit vote and the Trump vote was not that indeed it was just economic inequality, but that the people in different groups of society literally do not talk, do not know each other, and also listen to completely different news sources. So, you know, in Oxford, a lot of people thought that Brexit would not happen because people read The Economist, they read the FT, they read the New York Times, they like, you know, EU scientists for Europe. So you think that the world thinks like you. And then you realize that there's the sun, the mirror, all sorts of other newspapers which give a completely different view on the world and we don't read that and they, people who read those newspapers and the sun always wins, right? Any referendum or election. Excuse they me, don't is there a question FC. here? So my question, sorry. So my question is, um, how do you make sure that people of different parts of society uh, come into contact with each other's ideas again? Because to me it seems that, that if for example, okay, I, I, I hear you. Uh, <laughs> 
Number one, I'm not so sure that your description of the good old days is accurate. Um, there are an awful lot of very elegant churches that I've been in, built back in the olden days, and the average person that went into those churches was not the person that did the construction or worked for the city picking up the garbage. Um, and I'm not so sure that they were uh, uh, stupider then in your allegation that the people, we, we our crowd, didn't understand what they were doing. Um, before we had all of the social media and all the polling and everything, you can make the case that we work together better than we do now. We just had classifications based on, generally it was economics. Sometimes I think a lot of what we think of as discrimination based on gender or race or ethnicity, whatever, is, um, is, is that, and instead I think it's more economic you tend to live with, because of pricing of housing, uh, people that are similar to you in terms of their earning ability. That would also get you homogeneity, if that's a word, whatever it is, uh, in terms of educational background. And sadly, it also gets you to live in a less diverse community if you measure it by race and gender and, and other things. Um, we have a big problem in the world. I, I would argue that today we are more segregated in America, certainly, than we were in terms of race than we were a dozen years ago. And yet we're just finishing up eight years with our first uh, black president. Why are we more separated than we were before? That is the question you've got to ask yourself. Uh, why during the Obama administration didn't we pull together? Well, I ask the president, that's his job really to pull people together. Um, and uh, we, uh, w there's a difference here. You, you say it's we versus them and we didn't understand. Take a look around this room. It is a reasonably diverse male, female, black, white, whatever group, much more so than any place else you will ever live. There's no other place you're gonna be that is as diverse in one group as you are here. It just isn't because the economics of who can afford to live in one neighborhood tends, unfortunately, because, and then it becomes opportunities aren't there, and there are a lot of reasons all, you, you can figure, it, it, one thing feeds on itself, but we today are more diverse on campus than we ever were before. Harvard Business School this year is 20% white male. And when I went there, 1964 to 66, there were three women. It was the first year they took women. And I don't remember any diversity whatsoever in terms of ethnicity. There might have been a little bit, 650 kids, basically none. Today, we've on campus managed to diversify. But your argument is we don't listen and we don't understand the rest of the country better in fact, you're saying your allegations, we understand it worse than we did before. You can't have it both ways. We are more diverse, but we don't listen. Why? Because we care more about people who are like us. And in this case, it's like us in terms of academic uh, credentials. It's like us in terms of economic earning power uh, rather than lineage. But um, the world is still stratified based on how much you can earn and that's going to get worse because the skill sets needed for jobs today keep going up. Our education system is getting worse, and so you're gonna have more of a divide. And uh, the fact that we think everybody reads the FT and the Wall Street Journal, shame on us. I mean, I don't know that I ever thought that quite honestly. Uh, did uh, Hillary Clinton think it and Donald Trump didn't? I don't think that's the case either media play and if you look at America all the big newspapers okay like uh, we got to finish but the media remember look the time thank out. you very much time out the media is one of the most demo, uh, democratic institutions you will ever meet they only care about selling inches and minutes and if you want scandal and failure they will put it on the front page and if you don't buy the paper that day they'll go over and put a sunny face on the paper but they're just giving you what they want. The media doesn't have a preconceived notion 
maybe the New York Times editorial page does, but basically, <laughs> basically they don't. The, the, it, it, if, if Monica Lewinsky is on the front page of Time Magazine every single week, it's because no editions, of, copies of Time Magazine come back the next week. But as soon as they start coming back, they dump Monica and go on to Gary Condon, a congressman who had similar kinds of problems and, uh, as, as Bill Clinton did. It, it's, it, it, don't look in a mirror if you want to see why society is the way it is. We are the ones that didn't see Brexit coming. Not the people in the rest of the country. We're the ones that didn't think that Donald Trump had a chance. I don't know anybody that thought Donald Trump had a chance, although I did have two 50 cent bets just to hedge myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's a complex, let's leave you with this. Having said all this, look. The, the world is more complex than ever before. It is more dangerous than ever before because of technology and weapons and that sort of thing and free travel and that sort of thing. But the solution to our problems is more open borders, not closed borders. The solution to our problem is to improve education, not to try to penalize people because they are successful. If you don't have successful people, you're never gonna have the wherewithal to support, to help those who are not. We've tried socialism, it doesn't work, and I'll leave you with a thought. There was a guy, Bernie Sanders, who would have beaten Donald Trump the poll show, he would have walked away with it. But Hillary Clinton got the nomination for a variety of reasons. What did Donald Trump stand for? He stood for something, he called it democratic socialism. And the young people, I don't mean to knock young people, I wish I was one again, but young people listened to Donald Trump, uh, to uh, Bernie Sanders, and they said, yeah, democratic, that's good. Socialism, yeah, that's that social media stuff. <laughs> because our kids no longer learn civics in school, they no longer study Western history, they no longer read Western literature. We are trying to change and dumb down the system, and if you don't know what happened in the past, you're gonna have to relive it. It's unfortunate, but true, and we are, I think it's very dangerous. The world we're going into, you see a, the, both the left and the right coming up here, and the middle is getting, unfortunately, not listened to anymore, and it's the extremists that are going to shape the political culture if we're not careful going forward, and we've had extremism before, particularly on this continent, and it didn't work out very well. So your final point, which is who do we listen to, We've been thrilled to listen to you. Well, thank you very much. Because you, know, you have consistently been somebody who's lived a set of principles, been successful and led pe people. You've taken on major issues in the world. You've let data drive the decisions that you and your foundation and, and your government did. So I think we're all- Well, I just want one question. Yes. If I applied, would I get in here? 